Hello, everyone. So let's give people a couple minutes to join here. If you're already here, feel free to add your name already to the list, uh, to the agenda. Yes, I am. You can take the notes here. There you go.
All right, we have five minutes past the hour, so let's uh, get started here. Uh, first, the agenda item, as always, is introduction to newcomers. So this is obviously something that is totally voluntary. But if somebody is new here and just wants to say hi to the group, feel free to do so. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, yeah, Stefan, do you want to just quickly, maybe because it just said you, that would be great yeah. just to have some of the background. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Stefan. Uh, I'm a product manager at Spotify. Uh, I'm responsible for the recently open sourced project called Backstage that we're looking to donate to the CNCF. And I'm here to kind of listen in and, you know, understand the CNCF game, I guess. Welcome. Yeah, maybe, it's good you, to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Do you want to like share at least like a couple of minutes to share what Backstage is about for people who might not have heard about it yet? Um, sure, I can do that. You want yeah. me to do it now or later on? Uh, whatever you feel more comfortable with. We'll have some time today to go over it. It's not like a big presentation. We can schedule a deeper presentation, but just in case some people are not familiar with it, just a very brief high level information. Yeah, I think it take a couple of minutes at the end. Yeah, I'll just put it, you just put it in the end yeah, of the agenda. So then let's start with some organizational topics. We have still our logo discussion, which was now shut down and like, uh, when the vote was closed. And I think we should have a winner now, which is 21. And 21 is the kangaroo. So it seems we have a logo. I let Amy know who couldn't actually join us today. So and now we're at the next KubeCon that we meet in person, which is hopefully in Oren. We can then have our own socks. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I also put on the agenda, what I want to do more is also uh, have the working groups also present back on the work that they are doing. Uh, for those interested in any of the existing working groups, they have usually separate meetings where they dive deeper into to some topics. Uh, but I also want to give them more time that we can share and uh, that they can share some of their, their progress here. And also if you want to move discussions to the main SIG, uh, feel free to do so as well. Because um, like I said, I think with the air gap uh, working group, they were a bit struggling also with the, the timing, which I know especially for European folks was incredibly hard because I think it was Friday 8 p.m., which is a bit of a tough point there. Okay, so I think we have Mark here, right? Yeah. Yep. I can uh, give everybody a quick update on the work we've been working on on the operator working group. Um, I don't have a presentation or anything, but I'm, I'm happy to kind of walk through what we've been doing. Um, and where we are, um, what the conversation is, is around right now in, in the current operator working uh, group document. Um, so we've been meeting um, bi-weekly, um, starting to get a consensus on a few points of trying to define what a Kubernetes operator is. Um, we've narrowed down a few things. I think we have, you know, general um, consensus. Yeah, I'll definitely link to the doc here. Sorry. So, Here's the doc for everybody. Um, if you can pull it up on the screen share, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll do it in a second. Just great. put it in here as well. Um, so we, we've narrowed down a few things, like you know what what an operator is. It, you know, it extends the Kubernetes API to provides application domain specific knowledge, um, and an in cluster reconciliation loop. Um, you can definitely see in this document there's a lot of conversation going on still. Um, most recently, we've been uh, discussing, you know, who the target of this document is. Is it specifically, you know, written to the app developer or is it to the cluster operator at the end? Um, somebody 
else or some combination of those those audiences. Um, and there's been some interesting kind of technical conversation around trying to define, um, is there a requirement that an operator modifies in cluster resources or does what, you know, does, does, a, does a controller that's, that's modifying AWS or GCP resources, does that count as an operator? So trying to like think through the scenarios of, of what people are calling operators today and making sure that our definition isn't um, excluding anything, but it, it's, it's putting a more um, uh, true definable definition of an operator on it. Um, the, uh, the, the calls every, every other week, you know, the document's been going around on the mailing list also. There's still, like I mentioned, a lot of unresolved um, items in here. Um, we still, I think, need to dive into the, uh, the operator life cycle um, and whether that's even included as part of the operator definition or not. Um, it's down in this document a little bit more. Um, we're definitely, anybody, it's, it's every other Tuesday uh, starting next week. Um, in, we'd welcome anybody to join or, or participate in the mailing list. Um, I know there's a few people I've, I've seen in the, in the um, participants list here today that, that do join that operator working group call every other week also. That's kind of a quick update as to that for the operator working group. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think that the key is, so if you haven't read it, uh, I would definitely give it a read. And the next step here really is to, to get ahead of the comments and to join the last call. I think it's, it's good that we are starting to close down on, on a certain number of definitions uh, that have been circling around for a while. That question on whether, um, what that I really find interesting is the discussion about does it need to modify in cluster resources? Because we have a couple of examples where we have operators that actually don't modify in cluster resources, which is an interesting use case because in this case, Kubernetes is really more the platform for building the automation where the one that's, that's running it. Yeah, so uh, make everybody give it, give it a read and if you're not joining that meeting and so working with operators, it would be good. Also the yeah, because you're here, I think it's also Good to get uh, some of Red Hat. Um, the other thing that's this chart up here is the, I think, modified one in here, but to get up some some of the Red Hat expertise uh, into this Michael, one. Michael Rev Revnik is um, yeah. the Red Hat representative who's participating. So there's there's a, a Red Hatter already, I think, on all the okay, calls. Great. So, Let's see. Is there someone from the Helm um, universe um, participating in the calls? Mark? Matt, uh, Matt, Matt um, d does join uh, the calls pretty regularly and he's, he's pretty active in it, so yeah. All right, so there's some balance in the universe. <laughs> yes, we've, we've, the conversation has, has you know, you know the, the call last week, we actually did include does the installation of an operator, should that be defined as part of the operator definition? And I don't know if we, reached a conclusion on that, but you know, that was definitely the, the you know, part of that, the Helm contribution, making sure that we're thinking about the entire life cycle of an operator. Yeah, I think for me the key goal would still be that we get with this document to, to a level where we can update the current um, Kubernetes documentation about the operator pattern uh, with, with a more specific one. I think that's the goal that we eventually have. So, okay, uh, yeah, if you haven't read it yet, uh, I would recommend having a look at it. I think we have nobody joining today from the, let's see, uh, from the air gapped working group. Um, overall, the air gap one is an interesting one. So they started to look at air gapped installations of uh, Kubernetes. Because if you can install Kubernetes in an air gapped way, uh, it will be hard to install applications. There were several meetings there. Um, I, I talked to the, to, to the working group leads and in case you are interested, uh, please declare your interest. It seems like right now people are like kind of dropping off uh, the, the meetings. So it was a lot of popularity in the beginning but it seems to be obviously people have other work to do as well. But this was the highest ranked uh, request when we started to 
uh, when, we, when we discussed it last year at KubeCon, what people wanted to work on was sort of this air gap um, situation that we wanted to get involved in. And, um, I think we should also get more involved with the telecom uh, user group here as well, it's still an open action item, because it came a lot from the telecom industry who wants to use it for edge installation, which very often also air gap installation here. Okay, last item here on the agenda that I have in here. So this was a bit of an overview follow-up. We discussed the topics that people um, want us to work on, are interested in. It's like, okay, what's like next? What's on the agenda? What should we start working on? And initially I put together this Google Doc with questions that did not result in, in a lot of feedback. Honestly, I think there's just only one question there or one, one response there. So what I did and what I have here is the link. I took a number of questions that we thought are a good starting point for having a discussion with people and just asking them what they want us to, to focus on. And I just want to take today to just go over those issues and maybe I'll fix the typos that are in here, sorry. Uh, so the first one is, uh, do we have like a simple unified way for, for application definition? This was something we had also discussed as, as part of the charter in the beginning, like this ongoing question, how do I define what my application in Kubernetes is? And you could argue, okay, Helm can do it, but how do you handle then secrets? How do you handle third party uh, dependency and services? How do you handle these kind of things? And I would at least everybody in here to get started ask to provide obviously their feedback on this one here. And the way all these questions are structured, oops, sorry, right now is that like a general question, what do you think is an issue, it's a slight issue, uh, or it's a big issue for them so that we can eventually have a ranking, what are the most, the most critical topics. Um, and then there is obviously the open-ended answer of what people are using. And we deliberately went for um, open-ended here so that we don't say, okay, just people just have like a set of choices that they can make. And this is obviously a bit more work um, to, to go through this and then categorize it. But honestly, I don't expect like hundreds and hundreds of responses uh, out of this, it would just be some manner of work. Uh, the next topic to that, that we put on the, on the, and the delivery survey is how do you manage dependencies and also especially third party dependencies so dependencies that go beyond your existing applications like other services how do you even model dependencies which are what it ties into delivery like so this service depends on, on another service how can you express this even or how do you handle this uh, which ties into the next one like delivering complex applications um, ties a bit into to, to the operator discussion, discussion, but in general, like how can you ship applications of a certain complexity uh, with dependencies and how do you model it so they can easily be installed? I think this is something that we, from our experience, put in there. It's something we see more and more that people are shipping applications in Kubernetes that are more and more complex than they used to be. And this, still struggling with how to ideally do this. Um, there's other things coming in here obviously as well, like how do you, for example, if you have to define like certain service routes or configure certain things or they have to depend on third party that are installed in the cluster, whether they're there or not and how you want to handle it. And again, next question, here: yeah, packaging of applications if you get a kind of like off-the-shelf application experience. Uh, this is also something we see like a, an interesting point how people are handling this today. And something we start to, yes, there's like one is in, uh, I'm working on the typos here. Uh, topic here is, again, how do you kind of get this like off-the-shelf experience of installing an application on Kubernetes? Um, this is just the idea. So you have like your application, how do you package it? How do you ship it? Like in the old days where you had like your installer and you ship the binary and then installed the application. How do you really do this like on Kubernetes? 
uh, especially with a lot of the external dependencies, like where do you, for example, put your uh, container images? And how do you get them in the registry that is allowed by a lot of companies? Also from, from our personal experience, we see very often issues that obviously people are not downloading from public registries, so they have to export it, re-import it into their own registry, which kind of makes the experience for actually using them a bit hard. And that, that's why we put the question in there, how much of an issue, how much of an issue this is for people and um, how they're doing it today. Then going, yeah, then this is one like how to install applications with specific infrastructure requirements uh, into multiple different configured clusters. Uh, again, same issue you have, for example, for your application, a dependency on a service mesh or certain configurations that should be provided for a service mesh. Obviously, there is SMI, but there's also other dependencies and different clusters might have different capabilities. So a lot of these questions also go in a direction like you have to like, build the application once and have to install it into multiple clusters rather than building an application just, just for yourself. Again, how do you do it? And then the whole topic around chain of custody, uh, something we also start to see more. Do you even know what you're installing? Or how do you even know what you're installing and where these things are coming from and how they are validated? Um, again, we, we were discussing this for like boost that first version here uh, amongst the chairs. Like, how do you even know what I'm installing? If I'm getting a 2000 uh, lines um manifest file like what's everything in there where do these things come from and what are the dependencies that are pulling into my application and how can i being responsible for a production environment actually validate that what people are installing or what i'm trying to install here actually fulfills my security requirements and other requirements And then some of the automations, um, operations topics. So like, like how can I build certain things in a more, yeah. Carolyn, we will put uh, off the shelf application pieces in there that Carolyn just mentioned, we should define cloud applications. Um, so let me just fix my typo here. Um, Yeah, this is okay. Operators are right now really custom built. Uh, the question is, how can I get to more like reusable operational concepts that I want to use, and maybe also how how can I handle situations like also something that we, for example, internally learned when I have to suddenly have to run multiple operators at the same time because I'm using multiple infrastructure components, and how do I connect them together? Say I'm like using a Cassandra, I'm using an Elastic, I'm using my own application, and I'm using a Redis. So how can I get like this whole application stack uh, properly work together with its independent operational components? So this is a, this is a set of questions uh, that we have available right now. This is a starting point. So. Uh, the reason why I brought it up today is just I want to walk you through it. It'd be great to get your feedback and obviously responses on the questions. If you think that there is something missing in those questions that we should ask in people as well, uh, we can obviously add a couple more questions. If you think like, okay, this question is a bit off topic and we should refine it, please let us know as well. So then I'm opening up for, for comments on this one. So, I think this is this the survey is great. Um, who is the survey getting sent to? So we will work with uh, we have to work with the CMTF from reach it out reach out to the end user uh, community and also for the members some have it like uh, Diane maybe we can have some, maybe some feedback from the the, the open source commons community and like others have access to their communities as well. I know that. We try to get it by the CNTF, but the response rate is usually not that high. What I also would like to do is like for new members coming in or putting this on the landing GitHub page uh, for, for people. Like if you're here for the first time, this is the thing that you should familiarize yourself with. And also like being able to constantly add it. But 
I think once you're ready, I'd like to reach out to, to the CMDF where we could get that survey out there. Yeah, um, if you put it on the GitHub page with a link to it, um, I think one of the things we can do is we can, um, may I share it at the, on, through the Commons mailing list because there's about 20,000 people there. Not that they're all going to answer. Um, but also we could tweet it and socialize it, you know, via our own social channels too, to get some feedback. Yeah, that, that, that would be great. Um, obviously, we have the CNCF mailing list as well. We have the delivery mailing list. Um, we can also share it in some of the Kubernetes mailing list for people to give us feedback. I think there's a number of them. So, interestingly, what I've seen in, in, in the past is that if you get like 100, 200 replies, you're actually pretty good because people get a lot of surveys that they would have to fill out. and Especially if you're not offering them the free T-shirts, uh, uh, sometimes less might be able, able to answer them. But we can definitely work on this. For me, the most important thing is that we all feel comfortable with the questions. Um, so what I would ask everybody, just please provide feedback on this one if you think this makes sense or it doesn't make sense, or if you miss an important question that you think should be in there, or is it something is unclear. So, so my plan would be let's give it two weeks of a uh, review period. And then we use the CNCF and other channels to, to distribute it to get some feedback. Sounds good for everyone? Yeah. By the way, just yep. learned that they are even virtual some right now in Zoom, which is kind of interesting. Good. Yeah. So yeah, please provide feedback. I'll share it, the link. The links in obviously the agenda about the links will also be available um, in the chat later on as well. So then I think we are through the official agenda for today. So Stefan, do you want to share a bit more about your project for a couple of minutes? Sure, I can definitely do that. I can't un, un share my <laughs> can't share my video unfortunately because my camera mm -hmm. camera doesn't work apparently. Um, but uh, I'd be happy to to share my screen and, and run through a short. Oh, I have to show you. Uh, Stop here. Uh, I just wanted to give my my colleague Remy a chance to introduce himself. He was uh, he was here as well. I think as a first joiner. There he is. Luckily, my camera does work, so I can oh. I can sneak in here. But thank you, everybody, for having us. I see some familiar faces here. Uh, it's great to be here at the SIG. Uh, my name is Remy, and I'm the newly minted head of open source here at Spotify. Uh, we're starting to get more involved with the CNCF, both through backstage as well as just generally spinning up the open source program and getting more involved in the community. We appreciate the, the time today uh, as we sort of go through the, the sandbox proposal process and uh, we're getting excited about engaging more fully and uh, being around. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll share my screen here. Um... Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so Backstage, what is that? Um, so Backstage is essentially an open platform for building what we call uh, like loosely developer portals. And I'm going to do this. Uh, I didn't plan to run a demo. I mean, maybe we want to come back and do like a longer demo at, at some point. If yeah, we can do it in the next meeting if you want to do a yeah. longer demo. Yeah. Sure, but well, I'll just uh, walk you through sort of what it is and what the problem we're trying to solve is, uh, and then we can come back later for a more formal demo. Um, so, yeah, what is the problem that Backstage is trying to solve? Um, like the infrastructure landscape is pretty complex. I mean, if you look at like the CNCF alone, it's, it's huge. There's a lot of different open source projects and we have certainly built like our fair share of like internal infrastructure projects internally at Spotify. And um, that might not be like a, a problem in itself, but like if you look at like the, I mean, this is just an example of like the, the overall complexity of the landscape. And um, when you, the problem that we have kind of at Spotify was that we did have was that 
uh, as we were growing our infrastructure and adding more and more tools and more and more like infrastructure teams building you know distinct uh, pieces of our infrastructure uh, like the overall you know the overall thing or the ecosystem of tools started to become super complicated uh, to a point where actually like our engineers were starting to slow down because they couldn't either like find the tools or the tools that we were building like they didn't really connect with each other there was no like you know connecting tissue tissue between them or like you know every tool was built like for one specific purpose which is you know that's kind of how you build, I guess, a successful open source project. You solve one problem, you solve it really well. Uh, the problem is though, then when you sort of try to put all these pieces together uh, and ask engineers to kind of use all of these tools, uh, they will need to become kind of experts or at least operators of, of very many of the, these different infrastructure like things. Uh, and we don't necessarily think that an engineer at Spotify should really have to be an expert in infrastructure and the underlying tooling to be productive at Spotify. Uh, so what did we do then? Uh, the solution, like, you know, air quotes, I guess, is here to kind of uh, the, the, what we opted for was to bring, build a, one single consistent UI for all of our infrastructure. And that is backstage. So rather than having multiple multiple kind of infrastructure teams building you know their tools as distinct islands of infrastructure inside our ecosystem uh, we opted for a model where we would have one central team my team to build sort of a platform layer uh, where these different infrastructure teams kind of plugged in their infrastructure and made it into a consistent experience for for the end users who are the engineers and, and the developers at Spotify. Uh, so essentially what started to happen uh, or what we encouraged them was kind of almost to create kind of an app store, a marketplace for, for these tools. Uh, and uh, we were seeing uh, metrics as such as like onboarding time, which was getting longer and longer for new engineers as we were growing as a company uh, those metrics started to go down quite dramatically and we're now at the point where we were like after releasing backstage and kind of consolidating and centralizing all of our technical uh, like all the developer tools as well as technical documentation into one place uh, we actually cut that uh, developer like onboarding time with 55 percent uh, we measured that like time until you've sent your 10th pull request, which is, you know, not a perfect metric of productivity by any means, but at least something to sort of a proxy for, you know, the complexity here that we have been able to reduce. Uh, so when we, as we were kind of, you know, talking to other infrastructure teams inside companies similar to Spotify, uh, uh, they kind of, or in demo backstage, they were like, pretty amazed by how many different things we had been able to sort of put into one central place and, and sort of create a more consistent developer experience. And uh, that's when we started to think about like, is this something that, you know, is this a problem that we've solved that kind of isn't unique just to Spotify, but maybe, you know, something that other companies are struggling with. Uh, and after doing you doing even more kind of, you know, user research or you know, talking to even more teams, we kind of decided that, yeah, this seems to be like a, a industry's wide problem. And uh, we think that we have a pretty interesting solution to it. So long-term, what we are hoping now with releasing Backstage as open source is kind of start building a more standardized engineering, you know, UI layer essentially for different infrastructure tools. So, and with the same kind of pluggable architecture so that you know developers and um, open source project maintainers from various projects can uh, can sort of make it easy for people to use their products by building an integration like a building a plugin as we call it uh, in backstage uh, and we're hoping that we can cr create kind of a big community around this so that's why we're here to like you know we're really excited about we're really eager to kind of get more people contributing to this because we think that if we can, can 
create kind of an open source marketplace for like developer experience kind of layer things, very wishy-washy. Uh, and where are multiple companies kind of, uh, you know, in joining in the community and building these different plugins so that, you know, in a couple of months, you walk up to backstage and we're using Jenkins, we're using Kubernetes, we're using, you know, Grafana, we're using Circle CI, whatever you're using, like there is a plugin for that. And you can just, you know, configure your version of backstage to match the infrastructure that you have. That's kind of the long term ambition we have with the project. Um, and the reason why we're kind of starting to engage with the CNCF because we think that, yeah, we really want to create a, you know, a good community around this because we don't think that Spotify can necessarily achieve this kind of bigger vision ourselves. I think that's, uh, that's it. Hopefully you have a, an overview of like what we're trying to do. Um, we're pretty we're off to a good start like we have had some like excellent response from the community like more than 200 companies have reached out to us and wanted like a personal demo and and very many of them are already trying it out and like you know running proof of concepts internally and starting to build plugins and uh, starting to kick the tires of it um, so we're pretty happy about the first like couple of months of progress and uh, yeah excited for the future any questions? I, I do have a question. I'm looking for my notes. Um, so you use terms like portal and, and user interface. Do you consider it mostly a kind of at that layer, at the UI layer? Um, because when you talk about developer productivity, you, you can start to think about you, you also talked about platform team and so is is backstage predominantly about creating kind of a, a as you said portal or pluggable ui um, over infrastructure and that is not part of back backstage uh, the way we look at it the uh, like philosophically at Spotify is that we want engineers to kind of have three interfaces that they primarily interact with. Like first is their code editor where they, you know, write the code. And the second is like GitHub or, you know, similar. Uh, and the third, like for everything that doesn't, you know, like that, that doesn't like fit into the that first two workflows, you know, we want there to be backstage. Like you shouldn't have to go hunt around, like, you know, looking for, uh, you know, debugging your data pipelines or looking at your deployments or, you know, checking out what security issues your software has right now. That should all be one system and that is backstage. That's kind of how we think about it. Okay. But, but backstage is pretty unopinionated when it comes to sort of the lower levels. So at Spotify, we now have, have over 130 different plugins uh, and they span from, you know, all different parts of like the software development stack like there's experimentation machine learning you know following your code from you know you know pushing it to production and like you know following it out to like with you you know monitoring and everything basically um so backstage is pretty unopinionated and we kind of let the different teams own you know a plugin and the use case so for example we have our ci team uh, they own and operate like a jenkins fleet under the hood but we don't expose that to our engineers. They they build a plugin in backstage instead, and so attaches okay. that to the service definitions and the service catalog that we have. Um, I think it might be related to, you know, the, the previous conversation about applications and and uh, you know we have a we kind of have a model for how we model our software and all that is represented in backstage. So so a team. As you can see here, for example, this like the overview page of things my team owns. Uh, all of those things are kind of integrated into Backstage, and then we have the tooling is kind of connected on top of that service catalog, if, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Looks cool. So there's nothing like really cool. There, there's nothing like Kubernetes specific or anything like that. Like we, for example, managed, you know, our, our transition from our homegrown version of Kubernetes into Kubernetes or GKE actually. 
you know, without users kind of changing the interface in backstage. So the infrastructure team responsible for that migration can sort of, you know, abstract away the differences between, you know, different container systems or even virtual machines or data centers when we were running there, kind of behind this glue layer, if you will. So cool. the way I can imagine is like, sorry. So the way I can imagine this is like, I provide some type of service and I install it and I write a plugin for, for backstage and then it's available to other people. Like I have my CI pipeline, I have my machine learning type of environment and I provide it and then a developer can say, I just want to use this for my project. Is, is this how it works? Uh, depends on who you mean the developer is like a, there are different players here. Like there's someone, you know, in the platform or infrastructure organization that kind of deploys backstage and provides, you know, a developer portal that has a lot of different tools and those developers, uh, they build the plugins and kind of integrate different tools and environments into backstage. And then you have on the other side, you have the, the users, right? Like the engineers, developers who are building, you know, you know, they're just users on backstage and they use it, you know, for doing any, any kind of support they need during, you know, product development in general. Does that answer your question? Yeah, um, I think I have a better understanding. I think it would really be good like to see the next time, obviously we can schedule a demo where we can like walk through the workflow for, for the different stakeholders, uh, what they're doing and that would even have to clarify it more. Absolutely. I, I do think it is an interesting uh, project to look at. There's a look at it. There's other initiatives going on. I just wanted to put them into more context. I was in the operator side. We have Operator Hub, which is very focused obviously on operators and how you can install them, manage them, having the lifecycle management in there. This is definitely going in a bit of a different direction. Uh, the CNCF was or is already were also working on a different project where they expose um, right now it's mostly Helm charts, but the plan is to go further with the, with the artifact hub. In case you haven't heard about it, that might also be interesting to look at. Just also from, okay, how do you relate like to these other projects? And if there's an overlap, or, which is not an issue, so there can obviously be an overlap um, anyway, but just that people put it into context. But I, I can see it. So um, questions from anybody else here in the room? Okay, maybe then we really schedule this for a demo in two weeks from now, if this is fine for you, then we can like really see it in action. And that's usually when more questions come up when people say, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. thanks for it. I'm short notice, just walking people through, but I think it's just helpful for people to have uh, some sort of understanding here. Yep. I mean, if you're, if you can't wait for the two weeks, there's a, a microsite that we have at backstage.io, uh, where we have like a demo section, a couple of YouTube videos showing how this is used internally at Spotify. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, feel free to also post this in the Slack channel. So if people mm. are interested, there's, there's usually more people on the Slack channel as well uh, that, that are those who participate in the meetings. So feel free to also post it there. All right, this actually gets us on top of the 45 minutes for this uh, meeting today. So thanks everybody for joining again for the next time. Please have a look at the questionnaire so we can send it out and schedule um, uh, schedule sending it out uh, via the different channels which we have. So looking forward to everybody's feedback and also we'll put them backstage demo on the agenda unless somebody has anything else they want to bring up today. All right, then enjoy the rest of your day, hopefully. Thank you. You too. Thank you very much. Bye. See you next meeting. Now.